question that will be finer worded than what I just said. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jordan. Um, yeah, my name is Jason Ackerman. I have the great honor of being the director of the Center for Ray Bradbury Studies. And I wanna welcome you all to the Bradbury Center's fourth annual Ray Bradbury Visiting Writers Lecture. The Center for Ray Bradbury Studies was founded in 2007 by Dr. Jonathan Eller and the late Dr. William Tupons. The initial mission of the center was to promote scholarship on Ray Bradbury, who is often neglected in the ivory towers of academia. Uh, through their initial work in the center, Dr. Eller and Dr. Tupons established a critical edition of Ray Bradbury's earliest works via the collected stories of Ray Bradbury and a scholarly journal, the new Ray Bradbury Review. What started out as a research center, small archive, and hub for Bradbury scholarship blossomed into one of the larger single author archives in the United States seemingly overnight in October 2013. When just a little more than a year after Ray Bradbury's passing, Indiana University received a massive gift of over 150,000 pages of Ray Bradbury's papers and hundreds of artifacts belonging to the late author. With this gift, we've been able to recreate Ray Bradbury's basement office with entirely original artifacts, his working library, his desks, his typewriters, and a whole host of other treasures. And our speaker tonight will deliver the address from that recreation of Ray Bradbury's office. Everyone wants to know why and how this collection ended up here in Indianapolis. And that's a long story and a good one, but I don't have time to go into all of that right now. Uh, the short answer is this. My predecessor, Dr. Jonathan Eller, knew Ray Bradbury for the last 23 years of the author's life. They were good friends. And after Bradbury passed away, his family and his close personal friend, Don Albright, wanted to see the collection preserved and made available to the public. They knew that John and the Bradbury Center uh, were the right people and the right institution for that job. And that is the reason that we've brought Ray Bradbury home to his Midwest roots. And uh, he's here in Indianapolis, just, uh, or at least his material legacy is here in Indianapolis, just a few hours away from his childhood home uh, in uh, Waukegan, Illinois. I know we're here to hear from Maurice, but I just wanna sneak in a few quick words about Ray Bradbury, who wrote much more than his famous novel, Fahrenheit 451. He published over 450 short stories and about a dozen novel length works. He spent his life dreaming of human beings reaching the stars and exploring the planets in our solar system. He was perhaps the most influential public advocate for the American space program. And we have a trove of treasures from Caltech, NASA, and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory that attest to that influence. Ray Bradbury was a fierce defender of First Amendment rights and the freedom of imagination. He never forgot where he came from. Uh, he spent his life promoting and advocating for public libraries. The man who received many, many prestigious awards, including a National Medal of Arts, the French Order of Arts and Letters, and a Pulitzer Prize, never attended college a day in his life. His family was too poor. He was a child of the Depression. So instead, after he graduated from high school, he spent his mornings at the Los Angeles Public Library and his afternoons selling newspapers as he honed his literary craft. Bradbury knew that he owed an immense debt to the public library, and he defended those institutions relentlessly because knowledge should be free and accessible to everyone. He claimed to have graduated from the public library at age 27 when he married his wife, Maggie. He believed that literacy was our best technology, that it should be celebrated and continually developed. And this is reflected in his famous quote, you don't have to burn books to destroy a culture, just get people to stop reading them. And here at the Bradbury Center, we try to carry that passion for the written word to new generations. Our work here is to read great books and connect others to those great books, to encourage people to discipline themselves in becoming better readers, better writers, and better thinkers. So tonight, 
we are beyond thrilled to have Maurice Broadus deliver our writer's lecture. Maurice calls himself an accidental teacher, an accidental librarian, and a purposeful community organizer. He's also an excellent writer. His work has appeared in magazines such as the magazine of F and SF, that's fantasy and science fiction, Light Speed, Beneath Ceaseless Skies, Asimov's, and Uncanny. And some of his stories have been collected in the voices of martyrs. His novels include the Urban Fantasy Trilogy, The Knights of Breton Court, the steampunk novel, Pimp My Airship, and the middle grade detective novel series, The Usual Suspects, and he's got one other coming out this spring. As an editor, his work, he's worked on Dark Faith, Fireside Magazine, and Apex Magazine. With a dozen novels and nearly 100 short stories in print, he's also in the gaming world. And that work includes writing for Marvel superheroes, Leverage, and fly, Firefly role-playing games as the uh, Storium online game. He's worked as a consultant for Watch Dogs 2 and Dungeons and Dragons. His tie-in fiction includes stories in Vampire 20th, Century, Vampire 20th Anniversary Edition, The Dark Ages, Pugmire, Powered Up, and Knaves, A Blackguard. Maurice's life's work is very much in line with Bradbury's legacy. He writes great stories and he works relentlessly for the improvement of his community. In his community development, he brings his longstanding passions for social justice, economic equality, and racial, racial reconciliation. This passion keeps him rooted as a teacher and a librarian at the Oaks Academy Middle School, and as a resident for community organizations like the Kepra Institute. Over the last couple of years, Maurice has become a close friend of mine. He serves on the Bradbury Center's advisory board and we've shared good food and more than a few glasses of wine. He's one of the most compassionate and real people you will ever meet. And I feel very, very fortunate to call him friend. And it is my great honor to present tonight's Ray Bradbury Writers Lecturer, Maurice Broadus. Ooh. <laughs> Thank you for that uh, introduction, Jason. Um, wow, it's weird hearing your resume out loud. It's like, oh man, I've done a thing or two. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because uh, you know I, I always sort of stumble when I uh, try to figure out how to introduce myself. You know, since I do kind of juggle three jobs, you know, I, you know I'm a science fiction and fantasy author. Uh, I'm a teacher and librarian at a middle school, and uh, I'm the resident uh, Afrofuturist at the Kepler Institute. And, uh, and, and I love introducing myself as the resident Afrofuturist at the, at the Kepler Institute because, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, resident Afrofuturist. You know, they'd sit there and nod and like, oh, yeah, yeah, Afrofuturist. Yeah, we, we encounter Afrofuturists all the time. So, yeah, I know exactly what that means. And I'm like, oh, oh OK. So, uh, and, well, actually, let me back up a little bit. So the Kepler Institute, uh, just so you all know, is a, is a grassroots community organization. And, and we, you know, we train up young people uh, to be community leaders. Uh, and basically, we use uh, entrepreneurial experiences to uh, sort of like live learning labs, you know, as we try to instill these lessons about what it means to do community wealth building. And, uh, and as an Afrofuturist, and, and actually all of the staff at the Kepler Institute is engaged in, in that kind of work, you know, think of us as uh, strategic foresight planners, except it's done through the lens uh, that's rooted in, in Black history and, and Black culture. And so, so we paint these, well, we create these vivid pictures, basically. That's the way I like to think of it, of, of what the world could look like and, and what, what it is we work towards, right? And so for me, it looks a lot like I get to dream alongside community, um, highlighting my neighbor's works and, and, and highlight, actually highlighting my neighbor and, and, and all the work that gets done in the community. And so I look at Afrofuturism as like this, this perfect marriage of like my faith and my social practice and my writing. Uh, because I, I look at it as science fiction that's applied to the, to the world that we live in. But that's who I am now. Uh, I grew up in a, a conservative fundamentalist church. Um, I was about 10 years old when, uh, when we moved to Indianapolis, right? So we were like the first black family in our neighborhood and my mom insisted that uh, we were to go to church. Um, and so she sent us with a, a coworker who lived in the neighborhood. Uh, and, and I hope you heard that, you know, it's one of those, 
oh, they look like a nice family. Yeah, go to church with them. Uh, and that's, that's sort of our introduction into, into church at that point. Um, so anyway, the, uh, the first time I was kicked out of Sunday school class, it was due to, <laughs> it was due to me attempting to come to terms with the story I, I just heard. All right, so, uh, so I'll try and paint this picture for you. And so we had this uh, grandmotherly looking uh, Sunday school teacher and she had just read us the story of uh, Noah and the flood. And, and then on the wall behind her, you know, you hung, the, hung this uh, flannel graph, which I think I'm betraying my age when I say you think like flannel graph. But anyway, so she had this flannel graph that had this fabric arc on it and it was sitting on the, this. And so there's a fabric Noah in, in the arc bobbing on, on the, this fabric uh, flood waters. And then she invited each of the students in the class to, to come and put an animal on the ark. And so, you know, so the pastor's son was in this class. And so he goes and puts a, a, a lion on, on the ark and uh, his buddy goes up and he puts a giraffe on the ark. And, and then it's my turn. And you know, I take a couple of the fabric people that were left over and I, I start laying them on top of the water. And she asked me, what are you doing? And I'm like, that, is the story we, uh, we just heard, right? So yeah, so that was the first time I was kicked out of Sunday school class. But you know, I didn't realize at the time that you know, I was, that was me wrestling with something. That was, uh, even with me as a, a 10 year old boy, that was me wrestling with it with a, a large idea. And there's this idea of this post-apocalyptic narrative. And, and I'm trying to reconcile this with, uh, with, with my faith. And I'm sure this is what helped stir my uh, interest in dark stories. But uh, I didn't realize how a pivotal moment this was actually gonna be for me in, in my journey. Uh, another Sunday school teacher heard about this incident and, uh, and he invited me to, to come hang out with him. And so you got a picture, this is a, a, a more innocent age and you know, I suppose, because we didn't think anything of it. And uh, he and I got together, we had pizza and, and we talked and, and then he goes, you know, I have something I wanna show you. And so we go back to this back room and again, a more innocent age. Um, but he opens up this door and then my life was like forever changed, right? Because in this room, it's filled with like Doctor Who and, and Star Trek and all these episodes are on like VHS tape and, and all these, uh, all, all this sci-fi memorabilia and then rows upon rows of comic books. And then he just turns to me and goes, yeah, I think you're one of us. Uh, and this was uh, ironic for a couple of reasons. So, so one, um, yeah, my mom ended up burning my comic book collection. Uh, I think about that. Um, and and that's, this was a whole thing uh, because she thought my grades were slipping uh, due to this growing obsession I have with, with comic books. And, and admittedly, there's probably a little bit of truth to that. Um, and, but she thought the threat of uh, burning comic books and then, you know, obviously the act of having to follow through because you just can't have an idle threat. Uh, you know, she thought all of that would motivate me. A and it did, um, because there was like this whole, you know, Mission Impossible search and rescue mission that me and my brother mounted, you know, to try and rescue uh, m most of my books. And, and like I said, it, it was a whole thing. But anyway, that's one of the reasons. The second reason why uh, all of this was so ironic is because I actually first encountered Ray Bradbury in a comic book first, and I, I didn't even realize it. So. I came across Ray Bradbury's work at a, a particularly formative time uh, in my writing career. You know, my first love is, a, is, is for short stories. You probably heard that, I got a sense of that in my bio. You know, he's written 12 books, but he has over hundred short stories that, that, that he's published because that, that's, that's my first love. And so uh, this is early in my career. And so I'm in this formative stage and everything. And so I'm trying to read as many collections as, as I can. Right? Because the, the hardest thing for a writer to do is figure out their, their own unique, authentic voice. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to figure out, you know, what exactly my authorial, uh, authorial voice is going to be, you know, but I'm also trying to figure out who I am at, at, at the same time, you know, I, I knew I was black and, and, and still am. Uh, I also knew that I was a Christian and spoilers, still am. Uh, but I was in the process of discovering, you know, what do these things mean to me in my life and as well as in my writing, right? And so writers like uh, Octavia Butler, Parable of the Sower and, and Walter Mosley with his uh, book, Futureland and, and Toni Morrison's Beloved, 
you know, these were shaping my idea of what it meant to be a black writer. And, uh, and I was reading a lot of horror at the time, uh, especially back then, studying as many of the foundational writers as possible. And uh, it's during this time that I came across uh, The Illustrated Man, which, which blew my mind. And then I devoured October Country, and, and which led me to uh, his, his book, Something Wicked This Way Comes. Um, so obviously there are two uh, Ray Bradbury stories that really stick out to me. Um, one's called The Other Foot, and the other is called The Man. But if I jump into those, let me, let me just back up a little bit again. So you gotta realize at this time, you know, I'm, I'm coming at publishing a, as a black writer. And let's just say that uh, as I'm doing all this uh, exploration across genre and everything, I, I wasn't encountering a, a lot of stories with, that had people that looked like me in them, right? Um, and, I told, and I said, I was do, reading a lot of the foundational writers. Well, uh, before I got to Bradbury, I'd just come out, uh, off of this, uh, un, uh, we'll call it an unfortunate stint right, uh, of uh, reading a, a lot of H.P. Lovecraft. And uh, yeah, H.P. Lovecraft stories left me with uh, feelings. Uh, for those who don't know who H.P. Uh, Lovecraft uh, is or uh, have only heard about Lovecraft through uh, the, the TV series uh, Lovecraft Country. So H.P. Uh, Lovecraft was a foundational horror writer. He's big in, into cosmic horror. Uh, opened up that you know that whole brand of, of exposing of uh, writing about these uh, elder gods and the this greater mythology of, of, of uh, his mythos and everything um also were virulent racist uh and uh and people try to defend him uh by saying well you know he, he was a man of his time uh which you know i hear that but you know what you know in studying you know those times you know there were other racists at that time who looked at Lovecraft and was like, dang, dude, you, whoo, yeah, you need to chill. Uh, so, you know, so that, that's how I was coming at, at Lovecraft. And so I was already in this headspace of coming to this conclusion that, you know, black people were either being erased from the genre or were just simply in this category of just being othered, you know, to, to say the least. Which is, you know, when I stumbled across uh, Bradbury's story, The Other Foot. Now, Space has uh, always been the place for a lot of a black, uh, a lot of black imagination and, and, and creative thought. Because you know, think about what space represents. Right? It, it's infinite possibilities that that that. It, yeah, it's just infinite possibilities, right? And, and this whole idea of this infinite possibilities, this whole idea that anything is possible, you know, lines up with imagining black freedoms. You know, and I'm sure those sort of dreams is, is what fueled uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's story, his, his sci-fi story, uh, The Comet. And so, you know, I so I'm, have all this swirling around in my head, you know, when I encounter uh, Ray Bradbury's The Other Foot, because, you know, as I'm reading it, I realize that Bradbury's challenging his contemporaries at the time, you know, in terms of how Black people were portrayed and how Black people were imagined. You know, the whole idea that uh, our futures, our community, our culture, they don't have to be tethered to this planet or its systems. You know, in the story's passages, you know, I didn't have to suffer through descriptions of being seen as swarthy or, or dusky as uh, Lovecraft liked to describe any other. Bradbury's stories had black people. Uh, and in the case of, of The Other Foot, it, we have a, an all black colony on Mars. Uh, and so uh, it's sort of this uh, interstellar Black Wall Street of, of folks who were just fed up of, of living under uh, the oppressive systems of, of back here on Earth. And they hopped on a starship called the Black Star Line. Yeah, we need a moment of silence just to pause on that. The Black Star Line. Uh, <laughs> and, and they go off and they carve out their own space on their terms. Uh, and then one day a, a, a ship with, with white folks lands and, and, and they start to explain that earth has had this atomic war in, in, their, in, in their absence. And now they're looking to find a, a new home and they wanna be taken in as refugees. So then the characters begin to debate, you know, whether white people should be forgiven for their history of atrocities. And uh, in a lot of ways, uh, the other foot is sort of like this spiritual sequel to another of uh, Bradbury stories uh, called Way in the Middle of the Air. And, and you gotta keep in mind, both were written during the height of the Jim Crow era. And in Way in the Middle of the Air, Bradbury illustrates you know, some of the inherent contradictions uh, of the American system of oppression. 
You know, so the same white folks who are holding up segregation, you know, they become angry at the idea of black folks deciding, oh, you know what, we're out. Um, in fact, one character goes, how dare they go without giving us notice? Now, don't get me wrong, you know, neither one of these stories are gonna pass any sort of modern uh, critical race theory analysis, right? But when, when I hear people talk about men being, uh, being men of their time, you know, there's a stark contrast between Bradbury and Lovecraft. Bradbury also challenged his readers with the idea of black people having agency and finding new life in spaces and, and places away from this planet beyond them. And he wrestled with, with themes and ideas in light of the times that he lived in with an eye towards a more equ equitable future. And, that, and that's important. You know, I've, I actually appreciate, and I, and I have appreciated what he attempted to do, you know, however imperfectly it was done. I've always appreciated what he was attempting to do. Now, I can't remember where I read The Man, only that uh, it had come up in a lot of conversations that I've been having uh, with other folks in the genre, you know, as I'm going through and wrestling with this idea of uh, what it means to be a Christian in, in science fiction. You know, and I'm, I'm going around, I'm, I'm trying to find examples of, of science fiction that's, that's done this well, that's woven in themes of Christianity or faith. And, and, and it's always funny, because I'm, I'm thinking back even to some of the first conferences I went to and, and this idea popped up and, and, and there would always be like these sort of whispers of like, hey, 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 have you heard about this story? And, uh, and so with, with, uh, with the man, so man was written in 1949 and, and Bradbury is telling this, this tale of this uh, uh, rocket ship that's on this uh, evangelist, uh, evangelistic mission uh, landing on Mars. You know, they're all set ready to, to, to talk to the people uh, uh, only to see their thunder, you know, has already been taken by this Christ-like figure who, who you know, they've, uh, who just left a, a couple hours before. So uh, this is a horrible story summary, but uh, hey, we want to tell you about Christ. Oh, really? Just missed him. Okay, that's a horrible summary, but <laughs> that's, that's basically that's a, lot, a lot of the story. Uh, but it, was, it also represented another critical piece for me in terms of what it meant to wrestle with the idea of my faith and my stories. You know, what it means to do that in, a, in an authentic way, not in a, I'm here to, to preach to you in an evangelized sort of way, but what does it mean to do this from, this, uh, from an authentic place? And, and so we see Bradbury continuing to, to weave uh, ideas of his faith in, in other stories too. Uh, there's an, another one called uh, uh, Bless Me Father for I Have Sinned. You know, we have priests and ordinary people all searching and, and finding redemption. Now, I read that uh, Bradbury described himself and his faith as sort of, well, he described himself as being a, a delicatessen religionist. You know, he, he was inspired by Eastern and Western religions, and he, but, he, but he centered his faith on the idea of love. Everything sprang from that. You know, be it his writing, uh, he, when he wrote his first short story, The Age of Twelve, or, or his marriage to his, uh, his muse and, and wife, uh, Maggie, or, or his friendships, you know, with everyone from Walt Disney to Gene Roddenberry to Alfred Hitchcock, you know, all of it came back to love. Uh, in fact, I read once that uh, uh, someone said that Bradbury was in love with love. And when I read that, that, that really, really resonated with me. Because uh, if you were to ask me to uh, talk about my faith, I'm still sort of uncertain in, in uh, you know, what, what's the best way to describe that? You know, how, how do I describe how I try to move through the world, how, how I go about this pursuit of, of truth? Um, in fact, when I was last asked about what kind of Christian I am, uh, you know, the, the person I, I know that they were like looking for some sort of easy label to pin on me, right? You know, is Baptist, Presbyterian, are you Calvinist? Uh, just try to, try to get a sense of uh, where my theology is. Um, but, and, and by this point, you know, I've been called a lot of things. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, I guess I've been called a lot of things. But in this case, I've been called everything from like a, a Christian Buddhist to a, a Christian humanist to post-denominational, um, which is all fine. Uh, I, I sort of describe myself more as a, as a simple theologian, as a, a simple theologian. So, uh, you know, as I, as I approach the Bible, and this is after, you know, years of, of journeying and, and searching and questioning and being kicked out of many Sunday school classes, um, 
I sort of approach the Bible as like this series of stories that I'm using to, sh to shape and mold myself by. You know, and as I understand the, the overarching story of the Bible, you know, I, I see it as one of uh, God just saying, you know what, I know you and I love you. And it's trying to pursue a relationship with us. And, and those, those, that's the idea I keep coming back to. I know you and I love you. And the, my life then becomes this, this response to that. So all I want to do is, uh, is to, to know God and, and pursue a relationship with them. You know, I want to follow Christ and model him, and, and I want to pursue relationships with others. In other words, I'm called to love. I'm called to reconcile. I'm called to pursue justice. I'm called to leave the world a better place for me having passed through it. You know, I believe that God loves me. And in response to that, I in turn return that love and, and then actually caught up in an overflow of that. I, I endeavor to love others as best as I can. You know, I'm getting to know you. I'm, I'm having conversations with you. Uh, and, and then you know, that sort of reverberates through the rest of my life because you know, I, I'm like, my life and my writing comes down to this, this continual practice of story. And, and I love hearing other people's story. I think that's one of the reasons why I loved editing uh, Dark, the Dark Faith Anthology so much. Uh, I love encountering uh, each other as stories, you know, bumping up and, and connecting to others uh, and as we're all these fellow participants and, and, and co-authors of a story of reconciliation and healing. So, so here's what this means in practical terms for, for my life and, and in my writing. You know, if I don't challenge the paradigms of society, I've missed the point of my calling. If I don't challenge the social constructs about me, I've missed the point of my calling. If I don't challenge power dynamics, I've missed the point of my calling. If I don't challenge oppressive systems about me, I've missed the point of my calling. And if I don't love you well, I've missed the point of my calling. Simple. Now, Ray Bradbury he wasn't a perfect man. And I'm not sitting in his office, you know, claiming here to be a perfect one either. I'm just not. But here's the thing, though. His work can be engaged with critically. You know, his stories aren't easily dismissed because of the context in which they were written. So we're, we, we live in dark days. Not quite post-apocalyptic, but times are rough and the work is hard. And so leaning into the lessons that uh, Afrofuturism has taught me has, has become critical to my work in ways I, I hadn't imagined. You know, science fiction became me giving myself permission and, and room to dream about possibilities. This meant, you know, as I, you know, originally, like I said, I came up as a horror writer, but now I'm, I'm writing from a different mental and spiritual place, you know, one of what I'll call future hope. In fact, I can't wait for uh, what people think of my next novel. I have a sci-fi novel coming out in March called Sweep of Stars, because that's, that's where my head's at these days. You know, I'm, I'm dreaming of the stars. I'm imagining us existing on our terms, living in harmony and, and exploring the cosmos. Because sometimes we get so caught up in surviving today, we can lose sight, lose sight of the fact that uh, part of what we're to be about is creating the future we want to see. In other words, we're, so, we're supposed to be doing that Afrofuturist work. And in doing that, you know, actually I'm, I'm just hoping that, you know, my, my stories allow me and, and, and my community that, that, again, that space to, to dream and of what a better tomorrow could look like. You know, that dreaming impacts the work and the work impacts the writing, the writing impacts the dreaming, and so it goes. So uh, as a librarian, as a writer, as a teacher, I'm, I'm feeling pretty confident Ray would agree with me when I say that I am cognizant of the fact that we have a sacred responsibility. Because and because I am a writer, I, you know, I'm choosing my words carefully. So, so let me repeat that. We have a sacred responsibility. As writers, we are the creators of stories. As librarians, we are the keepers of stories. 
We are the cultural and institutional memory of our society. As teachers, we have the responsibility to pass those stories down. The stories that shape us as people, the stories that shape us as a culture, the stories that shape future generations. This is how we begin to create the future we want to see together to help make the world a better place. Thank you. Um, but I was also asked to do a reading. So, um, and so when I was trying to think of what I could read, um, yeah, you know, I was trying to choose a story of mine that would sort of tie together all the, all the themes uh, that, that we've talked about that, that Jason spoke of uh, in his introduction and, and that, you know, I thought about as I was writing, uh, doing, writing the keynote. And, uh, and I, I decided on the story called uh, The Legacy of Alexandria. Um, it's a story that uh, I wrote for uh, Apex Magazine. It came out uh, last, actually, I think it was like about this time last year in, in Apex Magazine. Um, and I'm going to read a, a, an abbreviated version of that, of that story because I was being paid by the word. And so the original story is much longer. So um, I'm reading you the, the uh, abridged version of, of the story. So uh, the legacy of Alexandria. Raheem dragged a shopping cart of his belongings along the cracked sidewalk. His dog, Muttley, trailed behind him. With the highways flooded, he followed the dense foliage lining the creek, which wouldn't be much cover for him much longer if he wanted to, if he were intent on making his way deeper into the neighborhood. If it were night, he'd be following the drinking gourd, finding the brightest jewel in the sky and following its direction. By some movement stirring his spirit he couldn't explain, he just knew it was the right way. He opened the game map he designed. Its signal piggybacked on an obsolete network no one had bothered to shut off. Despite its hazy quality, the air wasn't noticeably cold, barely a breeze, but his ears grew numb. Raheem adjusted his rebreather unit. His hand-me-down first-generation oxygenator nearly covered his entire face. The preening susurrus of voices froze him. Ducking behind the underbrush, shielding the road, he hid from the security checkpoint. Indiana was a free state, so climate refugees supposedly could pass through unmolested. However, that didn't stop self-styled patrols from taking it upon themselves to detain citizens for repatriation. The Knights of the White Camellia, soldiers in the army of the Lord. Rahim's ancestors knew folks like them back in the day calling themselves cattle hunters. You see, a cleric had de declared the global rise in temperature as part of a coordinated attack by American technology, exasperating already fraying tensions between nations. All it took to spark another series of wars. Politicians leapt on the distractions they presented, an excuse to lay claim to resources, claim safer lands free of mega droughts and hurricanes. The pandemic of despair gripped the sprawl of the city. All the chaos supported by the city's homegrown militia of faith but getting to the library was all that mattered anymore, the only thing he had left. Rahim approached a rise, not quite daring to be a hill, leading to an empty lot adjacent to a house. Across the street, two other houses, nondescript by most accounts, hid under a stand of trees and bushes. The surrounding prefab houses with their designed obsolescence didn't stand a chance against cli the climate reshaping, but these remaining homes were over 100 years old, built in an earlier age, meant to last. A freestanding gate unconnected to any fencing blocked the sidewalk. You, uh, you sure you wanna go in there? Your life may be forever changed if you do, Muttley said. The geriatric dog, blind in one eye and half deaf, cocked his head to one side. The grave his chin gave him the bearing of an old man. Pitching his backpack higher on his shoulder, Rahim unlatched the gate and followed the concrete path leading to the front steps of the dull beige two-story home. Before he could knock, the door swung open a few centimeters. A young man, little older than Rahim, glared with an appraising eye. Open? Words did not come easy to Rahim. This one scraped against his throat. Who are you? The man ran his fingers through thick, unkempt curls. He chewed on a toothpick. Tell him you're a patron, Muttley said. Uh, a patron. 
Raheem's heavy loaded eyes stared past the figure blocking the door. Yeah, then you'll know when it is. The docent, what Raheem understood the young man's guardian role to be, started to close the door. Let the boy in, Kamal, a woman's voice called out from behind him. We can't be who we say we are unless we're open to all. Raheem lowered Muttley to the ground. The docent eyed the pair of them, but stepped aside and allowed them entry. The hiss of the air purifier stopped them in the entryway. Raheem held his arms up as the enclosed space formed a bubble. The mechanism whirred, scrubbing the air. Only once they were through the seal did he remove his mask. Blackout curtains outfitted the windows to make the house harder to spot at night. Raheem ran a lone finger along, across the scars of the wood tables where students worked. Books stacked floor to ceiling lined much of the workspaces and any free flat surface. Kamal gestured toward the woman shelving more books, the head librarian. She was thin, her, her skin the color of burnished bronze, so much darker than his own complexion. Rahim grew self-conscious. Streaks of white ran through the hair visible from within his kente patterned wrap. Her outfit seemed more like being swaddled and enjoying red and black rolls of cloth. Her dignity unperturbed by the end of the world. Don't just stand there like a fart in a closed room, Mutley said. Tell him who you are. Brushing the occasional leaf, he ran his fingers through the tangled knots of his hair. Rahim, is that who you want to be? Now's your chance to remake yourself in any way imaginable, Mutley said. Now there's a, a tradition among rabbis to, to stop going by their given name, but by the title of their book. The name of my book is Donna Jaiwanza. She finished shelving a book and stepped closer to them. Ms. Jaiwanza to you. That there's Kamal. Don't let him intimidate you. I still remember him as Keegan, that, that clumsy little boy who used to run around here. I, man, I lost track of how many times he drove his bike into the telephone, cracked his nuts real good. I'm, I'm so glad you still feel the need to tell that story, Kamal said. <laughs> that shit cracks me up every time I remember it. It's big. Rahim ran his hand along the shelves. Mutley waddled as best he could behind him. It's okay. You're not much for your own words. She backed up a, a few steps to allow him more room. Libraries are built where they're needed most. The Paul Dunbar Library used to be a little east of here, the first library to serve our community. A little west of here was public library number one, the oldest library in the city. But they burned them a long time ago. Rahim wiggled his fingers and lowered his hands in a pantomime of raining. You're describing making it rain, Mutley said. Use your words. Fire. Rahim waved his hands at the shelves. Why? Burning books has always been an effective weapon against a community. We are people of the books. Reading trains readers and they don't even realize it's happening. Books are us trying to understand ourselves, a, a way to build resistance and resilience. To destroy our libraries is an attempt to erase us, our culture, our history, our stories. The librarian strode over to a different section of books, but paused to study him. Baby, you, you don't look good. Miss Jaiwanza ushered Rahim to a couch, shooing away the young people who were sitting there. Come on, come on, bring him some water and, and something from the garden. Rahim collapsed onto the couch, his face locked in a freeze of, her face locked in a freeze of concern. Miss Jaiwanza daubed his forehead. Mutley made two failed attempts to scamper onto the couch before giving up and licking his lips. Rahim handed, Kamal handed Rahim a glass of water. He chugged it greedily, causing Miss Jaiwanza to admonish him. Easy, you'll make yourself sick, sicker. She turned to Kamal, heat exhaustion. He must be all but, him, all but hallucinating. Rahim glanced down at Mutley. The dog settled in beneath him and rested a paw over his snout. Here, Kamal shoved a plate in front of him. Everything was grown in our garden across the way. As the food filled his belly, a wave of relief washed over him. He dared a hope that he might find what he needed here in order to belong. He cocked his head, unsure how to word the question which hadn't fully formed in his head. Yeah, yeah, I should probably begin by telling you how this place came to be. I'm a woman of many stories. Maybe I was born in a manger of books. Maybe I was library educated, my home library, my home a library in practice. Ms. Jaiwanza said. Raheem stared at her like he'd encountered an astral anomaly. You're not feeling that? All right, let's try this one. She strode over to the wall posters labeled AFRI charts. 
With a casual swipe, the image whirled like a, a spun globe. The image settled on the outline of Egypt. Now, not much is known about Egypt's library of Alexandria, what it looked like, where it was. Whispers about it having a half million documents, over a hundred librarians. But in 48 BC, Caesar burned the port of Alexandria. And not that he intended to, but the fire spread to the library. This was the first of four times it was burned. But each time it was restored, except for the last in 640 AD. By then the library scared people. It had become so much more. A communal brain, a near living thing of ideas and tradition and knowledge. So Khalifa Omar set it on fire. They say it burned for six months, but you can't burn an idea. Its legacy lives on. Rahim struggled to sit up. When he reached a more comfortable position, he'd forgotten where, uh, what he started to say. Though raised alongside siblings and community, he'd become reclusive. Once they were taken from him, he no longer interacted well with people. So, Mr. Man, a few words. Mr. Iwanza checked his temperature again. What brings you here? A book. Well, you've come to the right place. Mr. Iwanza arched a, a skeptical eyebrow. Any idea which one? Rahim shrugged. That's all right, you don't have to know. The books can choose you. That's what I love about libraries. They point us to a better way of being with one another. You know, if I stumble across a book I love, I bring it here so others can read it. That way I have other people I can discuss it with. Ms. Jawanza gave him a surmising gaze. Tapping her chin, she turned and flicked her finger against a shelf before presenting him with a book. Have you read this? He took the book into his hands, Meru Netter, the great oracle of Tahuti and the Egyptian system of spiritual COVID, uh, cultivation. I read Metu when I was eight. Who the hell gives Metu Netter to an eight-year-old? My mom. Oh, Miss Jaiwanza's voice lowered like someone who didn't want to extinguish flames they took so long to get going. Your mom sounds like an interesting teacher. Where is she? Her library has burned. Rahim read somewhere that in Senegal, this was a polite way of saying someone had died. It still seemed too small a phrase to describe the totality of her death. The boom of explosions rocked his home school, the roar of flames, the terrible cracking of timbers as the ceiling collapsed, the last image of his mother, her shoving him out of a window as the beams toppled. He screamed of her for her until he lost his voice. The scars along his arms itched. Wait, Ms. Jawanza said with dawning realization. You were, you were part of Bayard, weren't you? The Bayard Reston Home School. Rahim hadn't thought its full name in a long time. He did not commit to an answer, only, stro only stroked Mutley's thinning fur. Freeing himself from the clutches of the couch, the dog issued a thin stream of drool. Baby, you can't wipe all the tears away yourself. The stories remain as long as we survive to tell them. So talk about it all in, in your time. She handed him a different book. Start here. The way she said those last words made the book sound like an old friend. The weight of it felt comfortable and right in his arms. Cradling it since it had been damaged, the spine still cracked when he opened it. Hoping for the heavy press of fresh ink to waft, waft up, to be intoxicated by the spell of books, he inhaled. How do I check it out? You take the book, you read it, you bring it back. Ms. Jawanza cocked her head to the side. Wait, uh, you plan on stealing it? No. Good, and that's your promise to keep to the community. Rahim noted the young people gathering towards the, the rear door. What goes on out there? Anyone can read or participate in book study, but for the, the next level work, you need to bring something since everyone has to contribute for the betterment of the community, a demonstration of your commitment. Something? What else? Ms. Jawanza smiled a, a wry grin, too slick by half. A book. Then there's a scene where uh, Rahim and Kat, there's this terrifying encounter with Rahim and, and the cattle hunters and, and he barely escapes them, um, but he makes his way back to the library. So picking up there. What is it, Mr. Iwanza asked, are you all right? Rahim pantomimed something raining down and, and something exploding. In his head, his stories bristled with charm and he a bullshit artiste of the highest order as his father once teased him, a teller of tales, a quick-witted rogue, but these days his thoughts raced, a, a jumbled knot as if his tongue existed independently of him. Ms. Jawanza said, I, I don't understand what you're trying to tell me. Knights, Rahim squeezed out. Oh, damn cattle hunters, they follow you? Rahim shook his head. 
downstream a ways. They're coming for us, all of us, again. Raheem curled on the couch, wrapping his arms around his raised knees, rocking himself at the thought, Operation Shield. Yeah, we've heard rumors. You know, during times of, of upheaval, folks with power take steps to push their idea of the future forward. So we built contingencies. You know, we've been coming, they've been coming for us because they fear us. They don't understand what we're about, but we know who we're up against. Ms. Jawanza eased back in a chair to give him space and a measure of privacy. We have a long history of fighting misinformation. We're the library. Raheem slipped his backpack off. I want to learn more. I need to be a part of the work. What do you have for us? Mr. Jawanza's tone became solemn with the air of ritual. I have something to show you. Raheem opened his backpack with an air of reverence as if declaring a statement of faith. He withdrew his console and slid off the cover. Mr. Jawanza leaned over the box. Are those nanobots? Yes, but they're key to my bracelet. And if I concentrate in a certain way, he waved his arm. The nanobots took the rough shape of a rising wall. What do you call it? She stepped back, but continued inspecting. Funkenteleki, it's a way of being, makes you in sync with the nanobots. Fascinating, what, what's your plan? Right now, I can't get them to do much more than assume crude shapes, but if I can refine them, <coughs> see, your mistake is that you believe you have to go it alone. You know, your work alongside ours, as opposed to just our work together. A common Western mistake. You are one piece of a communal puzzle. Ms. Jawanza turned toward the back door. Meet me in biographies. The Samai Academy amounted to three houses in an empty lot. Each home accommodated a different section, but it was all communal space. Rahim opened up his game map and zoomed in. Attenuating his, the, its metrics as he went, he recorded his steps. He found that with enough data, he could map even the smallest space of a house in detail. As he walked across the street, Rahim had the unshakable feeling that he was being watched. Mutley bumped into his leg when he stopped to visor his hands to check the hazy sky for drones. A hawk perched on a nearby lamppost. The rest of the Samai Academy assembled in the dining room, a, a noisy gathering, doubling as communal meal and meeting. After a few minutes, the librarian stood, holding them in rapt attention as she ran through their, se their session. She gave a brief synopsis of a book before opening the discussion to apply its points to their present threat of climate reshaping. Now, if you look at the data, you can't help but be pessimistic, Kamal said. Only if you are data-driven. Data is a tool, which is why we have to embrace a non-rational approach to living, Ms. Jawanza said. You want us to go insane? Rahim asked. Right, that's one way to be unpredictable, uh, Camille chimed in. No, I'm suggesting we bring about the kind of change we can despite the data. Bring about, change, bring about the change we can in the space we find ourselves in. Ms. Jawanza's eyes had a way of focusing when all play left them. The Knights of the White Camellia feel deprived of what we have and are angry. And in that madness of fury and hate, they seek to dispossess us. What are they deprived of, Rahim asked. Ms. Jawanza worded the Afri chart again, pausing to make her next point. Humanity. A tapping at the window drew Rahim's attention. The hawk landed on the windowsill, peeking at it, pecking at it. Rahim walked over to it. Mutley raised his head in slow alarm. The rising whir stirred all too familiar memories. Rahim turned back to them. We have to go now. It's that sound, Kamal uh, closed his book and, and backed away from the window. Drones. It must be Operation Shield. Ms. Jawanza slammed a button on the wall next to her. Partitions, much, much like blast shields, dropped into place around the main shelves. Most of you know the drill. The ones that don't, follow those that do. Get away from the windows, get to the basement if you can, as far inside as possible. A few patrons panicked and dashed outside the front door. Against the empty lot, they loomed as easy targets. The first flechettes exploded like a series of knives from their chests, cutting them down like wheat under a threshing scythe. The next volley of shots pelted the house like a metallic hail. The explosions shook the library. Rahim crouched, still almost holding his breath. His hands covered his ears. Mutley tucked himself into his lap, alert but trembling as he stared out the window. The reflection of the flames danced in his milk glazed eyes. Before long, the wisps of smoke scarred the air. The barrage echoed in, in Rahim's mind far louder with the, echo of, in, with the echo chamber of memory. The gray smoke deepened to black, curling down the hallway like 
like a crawling wound. He gathered with the flames crackling to life, flaring with renewed vigor as they lapped at the books along the windowsills. The temperature within the library approached 451 degrees Fahrenheit and the pages ignited. The air quivered with the shimmer of heat mirage. Wind rushed to fill the vacuum created by the flames. Cracks spiderwebbed the glass. The hundred year old ceiling beams quickly spalled and buckled. Mutley issued a concerned whine. Hands reached down to, Mutley, to, to Rahim through the smoke. This way, Kamal, Kamal said. The docent, more wraith than man, pointed toward the cellar door. The steps, low and rickety, descended into an unfinished earthen basement. The cool rush of air ceased immediately, as if in a cave holding its breath. Other bodies huddled against him in an uncomfortable press. The patrons inched toward the re rear of the basement. Each one carried a stack of books as best they could. Rahim activated his gay map. By his map, they marched beneath the house, yet were past its boundaries. They entered a long, hastily constructed tunnel. He held tight to his backpack and Mutley as people jostled for position. The atmosphere grew thick and with mold and mildew topped by the cloying smells of dirt. The suffocating smell of unwashed bodies, the thick and gamey body odor coated his throat. Rahim fumbled to fit his rebreather into place. The temperature climbed steadily in the crush of bodies. He imagined them as runaway slaves desperately vying for escape along some hidden passageway, shuffling forward in baby steps toward freedom. Flies buzzed in his ears about his face with him unable to shoo them off because of his pinned arms. His shin barked against the exposed rock. The salt of his sweat ground into his scars. Muffled cries haunted the darkness. The steps became fewer. The pressure to scream built in his chest to just cry out if only to be heard. Mutley whined, a low howl, knowing something was wrong. It began with a pebble, falling as innocuously as a raindrop on a clear day. It careened down the hall, bouncing onto the head of Kamal, eventually skipping into the wedge of bodies. The silence reverberated out in the rippling pool. A low moan echoed along the chamber. The wall shuddered. The swell of bodies stressed the beams. The rafters supporting the ceiling bowed. Chunks of rock fell, a hard, unforgiving earthen rain as a wave of vibration swept through the strained cavern. People screamed. Some cries cut brutally short, their mouths filling with dirt. A chunk of rock crashed into the side of Rahim's head. The darkness swirled about his head, spread like a ebony wings of hopelessness, beating ever closer, entombed in this close space. No one would be coming to rescue them. Checking his app, he recognized their location, the swell of the empty lot. They were close to where it had to open. Rahim crouched low, the effort strained his rebreather unit. He opened his console. In a low, though stern voice, he said, give me a little room. Kamal stared at him. With a nod, he shouted, you heard the man, make as much room as you can. Rahim edged toward the sealed entrance. He gestured as if wanting so someone to stand up. The nanobots rose into a column. Think this will work? Kamal asked. Only one way to find out. Rahim corkscrewed his wrist, the nanobots spun. They burrowed into the earthen wall. The mound of earth churned with their action until a thin shaft of light began to emerge. A cool rush of air followed. Everyone, dig. Rahim closed his fist and the nanobots retreated to his console. Hands plunged into the hole, drawing away the dirt, expanding the opening. Rahim shoved Mutley through the aperture and, cl and climbed through after him. He took the stack of books from Kamal, setting them aside to allow the man room to exit. The other houses were on fire, but from their respective escape tunnels, they also had formed living chains, handing books to one another like communion wafers, passing knowledge down generations. We still exist, therefore we resist. Ms. Jawanza sidled up to Rahim. It's an audacious, defiant act of hope to preserve books, to declare that these stories matter to try to create a present that connects us to the future. We are a story that endures. Where do we go from here, Rahim asked. To wherever the next chapter takes us. They think we're destroyed or dead. We have the chance to create, create ourselves fresh, find someplace for ourselves, maybe the moon. But I make you this promise. I'm here to keep your story safe. Thank you. Maurice, that was beautiful. I don't know about anybody else, but uh, I believe I will be adding every single Maurice Brada story to my winter reading list <laughs> because that, oh my God, that is right up my alley. 
And did I detect a Bradbury shout out in there? Possibly. A little one. I saw the eye contact with the camera. <laughs> okay. And what was the name of that short story again? That was The Legacy of Alexandria. The Legacy That's of Mar Alexandria. Where, where can we get that story? If we want to read it in full and reread it? Yes, it is available on the uh, Apex Magazine website. And uh, I believe it's a free read for everybody. So have that. Really? Yep. All right. Love fan. Love fantastic. I, was right. I love free when you, when you said you were when it was when it was about the library of alexandria because i know i was reading this book by um susan orlean called the library book where she talks a lot about bradbury and she I, said bradbury cried when he found out the library of alexandria burned down and yeah. i just oh I, re I read that book. Uh, I read that book actually just prior to writing. Actually, that was one of the books I, I, that inspired that story, as a matter of fact. Um, I called yeah. the library book one of the best horror novels I read that year because it all it just keeps detailing all of these libraries that burned. Uh -huh. I'm like, there's nothing more terrifying to me than that. Um, and so there's a couple of shout outs to that book in, in, in the story, too. Yes, because that part where you said um, her library has burned. Mm -hmm. I when I read that in that book, I earmarked that forever because I was like, forever. because that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we do have some questions. Mm -hmm. So the first ones came in from Franklin Oliver, who unfortunately looks like he left early, but we'll pop it up on YouTube later if anybody okay. wants to watch it again. Um, his first question is, where does Bradbury's vision of the future most closely align with yours? Mm. Um, it's a big man, question. Uh, no, no, yeah, yeah I, I guess a great question. And uh, so, with the other foot, um, pro is, is probably is, is is the easy answer, honestly. Um, uh, so I I said I have a, an upcoming novel called Sweep of Stars. So mm -hmm. Sweep of Stars, in some ways, is like what if the other foot was centered centered black voices and centered the black imagination. That's basically what I'm doing with, with Sweep of Stars. And so with Sweep of Stars, there is a, a colony, um, a, a black colony. It, there's, it starts on the moon, but it's now expanded out. By the time this, the novel takes place, it's, it's expanded out. So um, it, it, there's, it's on the moon, it's on part of Mars, it's a part of a mining colony. Um, I think there's one other part where, where the community extends to, but I mean, so you have this, uh, a vast interstellar, this budding interstellar uh, community that, that's growing. And the, I even hinted that in this short story where, where uh, the librarian says, well, maybe we'll go to the moon. That's uh, a nod to uh, the upcoming story. So that's probably that, that vision where the visions kind of line up. And it's that, that whole idea of establishing a community um, on our terms, through our imagination, trying to free ourselves from the bond of, of a history of oppression. And, and even though that, like, like any any part of our past. I mean, we, we can't truly do anything brand new. We're, we're, we're always gonna be haunted by our past, but we can always strive to be as free or as, or to heal from that past as much as possible. And so uh, that's that's the the community that establishes itself by the time Sweep of Stars rolls around. So I'd say that, that'd probably be that, that area. Okay. Uh, next question is, what do you think Bradbury would say about Afrofuturism? Oh, I think he'd be excited by it. I think you would too. I think I think you would absolutely be excited by Afrofuturism, because uh, Ray Bradbury, is, as I've come to understand him, and I, and I did see him once uh, uh, before he passed. He he was a man who was, if nothing else, generous and and tried to open doors for for people. And and I think he'd be excited to see uh, the 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 rush of voices that have uh, have come through the doors of, of late. I think he'd be excited by the stories. I think he'd be excited by all the, the fresh ideas that are being presented. So excitement's the word I, I come back to. I'm like, I did not know that you met Bradbury and that is very exciting to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he, came, he came to Indianapolis because um, uh, it was not too long after a stroke and it was, it was a double feature. I mean, this, I mean, it was a geek, geek's dream. I mean, it was, it was Ray Bradbury and Douglas Adams. So, I mean, like, Okay. Who's not, who's not gonna go to that? Absolutely. So, uh, so I, I was absolutely there hanging on his every word and it, and it was amazing. 
I would have been fangirling so hard in the back. <laughs> Uh, okay, Nancy, lovely Nancy from the Bradbury Center, uh, has asked, uh, how would you challenge people to share their own stories, real or imagined? Mm. That's a great question. Um, and, uh, and actually, it's a, it's a relevant question because I, uh, I feel like I'm doing this all the time with my students. Uh, and so there, there's that, that, so the challenge comes with I mean, obviously it starts from a place of you, you actually, no, I take that back. It starts with this, because to my middle school students, I know you have something to say. I know you have something to say. And my job, frankly, is to get out of your way and let you have the room to say what it is you want to say. And that's how I begin a lot of my, uh, my writing instruction. It's just like, hey, you know what? In this space, there are no rules. I know, I know we, you know, during the day, during, during school, we teach all these rules and blah, 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 but, but now we're writing. We're, we're writing uh, fr from, a, from a place of ourselves. And so when we do that, there are no rules. We just have to get it out onto the page. And so whatever it takes to get it out onto the page, that's what we do. Um, so that encouragement to start with, you have something to say, and what you have to say is important. A lot of times that's been squashed out of us to, the, to where we where we get a drum into our heads that what we say doesn't matter, what we say isn't important. But you know, and I, I see myself largely as just a cheerleader to remind people, no, 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 your story is important. I mean, let's face it, there there are no new ideas. What what gets added to the the, the canon of literature are, are people's voices, their their unique spin on those ideas, and that's what I want to hear. I want to hear your voice. I want to hear your story because your voice, your story has value. So I want to hear it. So please share it with me. I wish I had Maurice brought us as a teacher. <laughs> you would have been great in my middle school, Maurice, so popular. <laughs> okay. It's, it's and, a good time. They keep me on my toes, I'll tell you that. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Another question in the chat. Oh, uh, how would you motivate young people to write their stories, sixth grade? And then you just began to answer my question. Do you have anything else to add to maybe the sixth grade level? At sixth grade, Sixth grade, sixth grade is such an interesting age because uh, as, as the librarian, I, I, you know, it's, it's the sixth graders that order the most books from the library. Uh, and then by eighth grade, you know, you start to see a sort, sort of tail, tail off. So, uh, so I'm always excited about sixth graders and I'm always trying to pick their brains and, 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 and like, hey, what, what, what books are you reading? What are you excited by? Um, and again, they are happy to, happy to tell you what they're reading and why why the as long as i'm not doing it in an essay form like write me an essay about why you're, you're excited that, that doesn't, doesn't hold as much sway but if i just say hey no let's have a conversation tell me why you're excited about this book they love to tell me about books they love to tell me about stories and so uh, and that's what i love about working with middle schoolers they like no they they love stories they they they, they are actually excited about them once you get out of the way and just let them you know hey you know what tell me your story on your terms let me see what that's like because we i can fix we can fix anything in, in second and third, fourth drafts. Well, they hate that whole fourth drafts thing, but we can fix anything in revision. But I want to, I want to get that story out of you first. That's, that's my first foremost concern. Let me just get the story out of you. Right. Um, I love that energy, Maurice. I see it, like, I'm gonna say it again. You should have been my sixth grade English teacher. <laughs> Our librarian was not as active with the kids. Right. <laughs> Okay, uh, another question. So we've talked about this in the Bradbury Center that this has kind of been your miracle year. You've been kicking a lot of butt this year, getting published all over the place. We're all very jealous of your success. We're just glad to be the wind beneath your wings at this point. <laughs> exactly. Um, so Bradbury in his writing career said he never really felt like a writer until he wrote The Lake. And that was his beautiful, emotional, dark sort of piece that made him feel like I've come into my own. I am a writer. I kick a lot of butt. Uh, I, you know, I'm, you know, paraphrasing. Uh, was there a certain story that you wrote that you felt like this is my time to shine? Mm. You know, it may have been Pimp My Airship. Um, both, both versions of it. Mm -hmm. Both versions. Both versions. So Pimp My Airship actually started off as a short story. Um, uh, it was published in uh, 2009, and uh, and it marked 
a departure in my career because up until then I had been writing mostly horror stuff. Um, right. And then I, I wrote Pin My Airship and uh, and there was just something special about that story. I knew it as soon as, as, soon as it was done, I was like, there is something about this story. Um, I, I think I have something here. It wasn't a perfect story by any stretch, uh, but I, I loved it. And, and that was the first story I was like, this story feels like the perfect distillation of who I am as a writer. And, um, and then, you know, fast forward, uh, you know, a decade, um, I came back to with an, a bit of an experiment to see, I, uh, cause like one of the criticisms of the story was like, there were a lot of readers who were like, man, I feel like there was a whole world in that story, a whole full, fully realized world in that story that we didn't get a chance to really see. And so, uh, uh, so I use that as a challenge to myself. So I, let's see what this world could look like. And so I wanted to see, uh, I wanted to write a novelization of my own short story. Um, but while I was doing that, there was a, a question I was, tr I was basically asking myself or trying to figure out for myself, which is, you know, I was haunted by this idea that, you know, I am just a writer. So like by this point, I'm, I've come to terms with the fact that I'm a writer, but now I'm like, I'm just a writer. Uh, and, and so what does that mean? What does it look like to use those gifts as a writer to impact my community, to impact the, the world around me? And so that was the central idea I was interrogating in, in, in the novelization of, of Pin My Airship because it features a, a, an open mic poet who basically that's the journey, well, that's one of the journeys he's on, which is this whole idea of I, I'm, I'm a poet, but how can that, how can my art be used to change the city, to change lives, to change history. I'm just a poet. And, uh, and, and so by wrestling with that question, by wrestling that qu with that question in the book, um, I was like, no, this is, yeah, this is me. This is me. That's fascinating. Also, because I mean, Bradbury was the same way where he wrote The Fireman as a short story and then it blew up when it became Fahrenheit 451. Look at you. Look at all those, look at all those just, crossing of lines. Following all sorts of footsteps. Look at you in your miracle year. <laughs> all right. Looks like I got one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what, oh, what would you suggest to motivate a person to start writing a short story if they feel like they don't really know where to start? Any ideas to mm. share? Yeah, because... Uh... Yeah, one, like I said, I, I tell my students, you have something to say. And I, I never have to go much further than that with middle school students because they, Lord knows, they've been my ear enough. They have something to say. <laughs> but you have something you care about. You have something you're passionate about. What is that something? And that, that's where I, I would begin. So uh, I, have a, I have a couple of, uh, <laughs> we'll call them mentees. Um, they look a lot like high school students who I once had as middle school students who apparently won't leave me alone once they graduate. And, and so they keep coming back and they'll ask me questions about, hey, Mr. Bross, I have to write this essay. Can you help me with this essay? And I'm like, all right, sure. You know, I have nothing better to do. And I have this novel due in a couple months, but you know, let's write your essay, um, which actually I do. I love writing, I love helping them write their essays because you know, I'm procrastinating from writing my novel. So <laughs> this just gives me a great excuse to do it. Um, and so, They'll, they'll say, well, I have to write this. Here's the topic for my essay. And it just doesn't hit me. Da, 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 da. I don't even know how I'm going to write it. And then I always challenge them with, that's not true. Because just by any topic you're given, there is something in there that you are passionate about, that you do care about. And so with one, I reminded her that, you know, you, you are a person who loves to create change in your world, who, who, who sees all these injustices. And, and tries to right those wrongs, even now as a high schooler. So take that passion, take that interest and apply it to this topic because that's actually about as far as I got before she was like, oh, Mr. Prados, I know exactly what I'm gonna write about. And I'm like, okay, yes, yes, go, go, go. Um, because we have these things that we care about. And sometimes it's just a matter of like figuring out what is it I care about? How do I apply it here? And then just go. And then it's my favorite rule that I give my students, give yourself permission to suck. Right, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be good. Because, like I said, we can fix all that. We can fix anything in later drafts. But give yourself permission to suck. Just get it out there. Uh, get the ideas out there, raw, unvarnished. Just get it out there. There's a lot to appreciate in some raw words. There's some power there. So, get it out there, because 
what's coming out, what's erupting out in that, that, you know, as you're vomiting these words onto the page, you're vomiting from this place of stuff that you care about, stuff that you're passionate about. So yeah, just get it out there. You, you'd be surprised how once you tap into what you care about, once you frankly figure that out, the words will come. The words will come. Give yourself permission to suck is my new motto. I yes. love it. <laughs> okay. Uh, it is 812. So I'm going to pass this back over to Jason now for some closing words. Thank you so much, Maurice. You are a treat. You are so welcome. So welcome. <laughs> Maurice, that was, that was absolutely spectacular. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and uh, it, the, the last point that you made about uh, just getting your words out there, you know, Bradbury's motto was don't think right, you know, get, get your intellect out of the way, you know, get, get, get the words on the page. And so there's, there's so much synergy between the two of you. It's very fitting that you gave that, uh, that, that wonderful lecture and that wonderful reading from Ray Bradbury, our recreation of Ray Bradbury's uh, basement office. Uh, so I want to thank everybody for coming. We had a great turnout for this event and uh, just wanted to, uh, to let you all know that we are an unbudgeted unit within the School of Liberal Arts. And so if you, if you enjoyed this program, if you want to see more programs like this, please consider supporting the Center for Ray Bradbury Studies. Jordan's going to put a link uh, to our giving page and uh, that, that would be uh, really wonderful if you could, if you could support us uh, in that way. Uh, aside from that, uh, thank you all for being here. Have a wonderful night. And uh, yeah, Maurice, again, thank you. It was awesome. Thank you for having me. It was truly my honor and privilege. All right. All right, and I have up the... Uh, the links in there for the newsletter and the donate button if you guys would like to check those out. Our newsletter is the Bradbury Bee and it's the Bee Sneeze. And on that note, I will shut us down, guys. Thank you so All much, right. everybody, for coming. It was a great Thanks, time. And here's my cat, you know, dive bombing.